to all the board members, if you can just um, take off your um, camera, turn off your camera. Uh, we don't need for you to be um, having the camera on at this in this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and start the recording. Okay. Yes, thank yes, you. Thank you. There's an echo coming through. I'm going to start now, Alex. Yes, ma'am, go for it. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Marta Lozano, assistant to the city manager's office. Thank you for participating this afternoon. This is a joint meeting of seven of the City of El Paso Sports and Commission. Due to the ongoing pandemic, the Texas governor has suspended specific provisions of the Texas Open Meetings Act to allow te telephonic and video conference meetings in order to avoid congregate settings in physical locations. The mayor and council and city council received this training on ethics in the code of conduct last month on October 22nd. And the city manager felt it was important that the same training be extended to members of all the city's boards and commission. We will begin this meeting by convening each board and commission prior to beginning the training. Once each board is convened, the training will begin with an ethics presentation by Mr. Frank Garza, outside counsel followed by a presentation on the code of conduct by Ms. Diana Nunez, training specialist with the Human Resources Department. Board members and commissioners, if you have a question, please raise your hand in the chat option so you can be acknowledged. If there are board members who are participating as audience, members, if you raise your hand at the end of each presentation, you will also be acknowledged. Thank you for your time and service to our community. As mentioned before, the city manager wanted to extend this training to all boards and commissions members. We have over 30 boards and commissions and close to 300 members. So the most efficient way is to have joint board meetings to make this happen. First, we're going to start by presenting boards with participants attending as an audience. The Veterans Affairs Advisory Committee, one board member participating. Can you please state your name for the record? Yes, ma'am. Laura Butler, District 5 back. Thank you, ma'am. Open Space Advisory Board, one board member attending. Can you please state your name? Open Space Advisory Board, do you have any member? Enrollment District 3. Thank you, sir. Historic Land Landmark Commission, one board, board member participating. Can you please state your name for the record? For the Historic Landmark Commission, do we have anybody participating right now? The next one, the Citizens Advisory Committee for the Board of the Mass Transit. We have one board member participating. Can you please state your name? Do we have someone from the Citizens Advisory Committee for the Board of the Mass Transit at this time? Now we're gonna follow with the Bicycle Advisory Committee, three board members participating as an audience. Can you please state your names for the record? Wayland Berlin game. Thank you. Two more members, please. Good, good afternoon, uh, Martha. This is Alfredo Austin, Bicycle Advisory Committee uh, Secretary. And <clears throat> as of right now, I only see Mr. Wayland Berlin game joining. Okay. <laughs> If you get a quorum on no, any of those um, boards that I just mentioned, 
please let me know so we can pause the meeting and we can take roll call of any of the boards having quorum that originally wasn't stated like that, that they don't have a quorum, but they're participating as an audience at this time. Now we're, we will convene the boards with quorum confirmed by having the board secretary or the chair member have the roll call of their members attending this meeting today. City Accessibility Advisory Committee, can you please, the chair or the secretary, take roll call of their board? Yes, uh, this is Julio Perez, ADA coordinator for the state of El Paso and also the uh, secretary for the Accessibility Advisory Committee. I see that we have a full quorum today. I see uh, Mr. Amre Umuko on the line, uh, sir. I'm here. I'm okay. here. I see uh, Charles Johnson uh, on the line as well. I see uh, Mark Salazar. Yes, this is Mark. I see Josue um, Rodriguez and Jose Martinez. Present. Present, Jose Martinez. And I think I got them all. Did I miss anyone? Betty, are you there on, on the line? And also Patricia White for the Open Space Advisory Board. Okay, thank you. Uh, Betty, are you on the line from, from the AAC? Okay, uh, that's all we have, but we do have a quorum. Thank you, Julio. I'm Padre Hernandez. What board are you in, ma'am? Pardon uh, What board are you um, a member of? Of the RSVP. Okay, we're, we're going to continue with that, um, with those boards in a minute, please. So now we have the Foster Grandparent Program Advisory Council and Retire and Senior Volunteer Program Advisory Council. These two boards merge into one, which is going to be called Senior Corps Advisory Council. Secretary, can you please confirm the quorum or the chair of this, these two uh, boards? Okay, good afternoon. This is Lorraine uh, with uh, RSVP, uh, Volunteer Program Specialist. Uh, we have Nelson Bank on the call. Mr. Bank? Yes, uh, hi, I'm with RSVP okay. and Foster Grandparent. Uh, Mr. Gilbert Blancas. Uh, Alicia DeJong Davis. Present. Okay. Armida Hernandez. Uh, Claudia Renteria Olguin, Everett Barnett, Tommy Hines, Janet Urick, Barbara Present. Martinez. Here. Am Amparo Hernandez. Here. Patricia Williams. Here. Romy Ledesma. Here. And Gerardo Navarro. Present. Okay. I'm here, we'll... Lorraine. I'm here. My phone was, my mic was muted. Okay. Is um, that... Armida. Okay, um, so we've met um, quorum. Okay, thank you. Thank you. As stated before, if uh, any of the boards attending as an audience, the secretaries notice that there's a quorum, please let me know so we can pause the meeting and we can convene your board. Just let me know on the chat or send me an email or a text, uh, however it's easier for you, but so we can convene your board as well, okay? So now we're going to start the meeting with the training, um, starting with Mr. Frank Garza, and he's going to be presenting the ethics uh, portion of this training. Ms. Lozano? Yes. This is Julio. Uh, I don't know if I'm the only one that this is happening to, but when I click on the chat, um, uh, it just um, it, it, it keeps on just uh, waiting. There's I can't get to it. So I don't know if others are having the same thing. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Garza, are you ready for the presentation?
I am ready whenever you are. Thank you, sir. IT, can you please pull out the presentation for Mr. Garza? Well, while they get that ready, let me uh, introduce myself. My name is Frank Garza, as I said. Uh, I'm a municipal lawyer here in San Antonio. Uh, so our well, our best wishes from our friends here in San Antonio to our friends in El Paso. Um, I am a practicing attorney for- Ms. Lozano, can I, can I please interrupt you real quick? There are no closed captions being shown. Can we please show those? I had seen them earlier. Yes, Alex. They're showing right now. Thank you, Alex. It, I'm here. It's just that when we present, it takes over the whole screen. Unless you don't want me to do it full screen, uh, yeah. we can do it that way. If you there, can do it where it if, doesn't need the full screen, I think it's important for them if, to. If you share, if you share the entire desktop. You can uh, share two uh, halves of the screen. One on one half, you can have the closed captioning, and then on the other half, you can have the presentation. Go ahead and, and see if we get the closed captioning here. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. Will this be, will this work? It's not full screen, but at least you can see the closed captioning. No closed captioning. Yeah. I I, I don't think the uh, folks are able to see the. Closed okay. Well, one second. I know why. Hold on. Okay. How about now? Can you guys see the closed captioning yet? Hold on. No. <laughs> so. On the video, there will be the closed caption. Give me one second. Hold on. It's, well, this is what I was telling you, Ms. Lozano. They will have to turn on the closed caption on their own. Like on the video that we're going to be sharing, there will be the closed caption will be there. But um, let me see. So the way it works is I've done this before. You share the entire screen. On one side of the screen, you have the presenter. Uh, and you pin that person on the screen, and then on the other half, on the other half of the screen, you have the. Uh, the uh, How about now? Uh, yes. Is that yes. better? Um, yes. I I think everyone would be as able to see the screen to some effect. Uh, and I think this is a real important reason as to why we should provide copies of this to the to the attendees because they may have difficulty reading some of this. But we'll go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Frank Garza. Uh, I'm a municipal attorney here in San Antonio. Uh, from our friends in San Antonio, we welcome we we wish the best for the, our our friends in El Paso. Uh, I've been practicing law for about 30 years, always representing cities and governmental entities. Um, I uh, have been doing ethics ordinances, ethics hearings, and I teach ethics at St. Mary's to uh, students who want to be in the public administration world. So I'm kind of familiar with most ethics ordinances in the state. And so uh, I've been selected to present to you today. Uh, I always show this first slide to everyone. And the reason I show this slide to everyone is because if you're a public official, whether you're elected, appointed, or a city employee, you live in a fishbowl. Uh, your actions can become used. Uh, when a private citizen gets a DWI, it doesn't really become a big story. But if your uh, council member or city manager were to get a DWI, it would become a huge story. So again, being a public official, a city official, you live in a fishbowl. Uh, and one of the reasons we do it in ethics is we're trying to avoid stories where, again, you become the story. We can go to the next slide. Uh, one more. You, you want to avoid becoming the story. If you were to read tomorrow's paper, 
And it said, read all about it. Elected officials brother gets lucrative city contract. Your first impression is going to be, oh, well, the only reason he got the contract is because his brother's an elected official. What if the person got the low bid? Or what if the person is the best qualified for the reason he received the contract? Many instances, people won't care. They'll just care that he's related to an elected official. Everyone who's listening today knows the difference between right and wrong. You've been told the difference between right and wrong from your parents, your grandparents, your teachers, uh, your priests, your ministers. The reason people adopt ethics rules is not to help people know the difference between right and wrong, but it's to avoid the perception of doing something wrong. Next slide, please. The city's policy, El Paso's policy, I want to say is one of the best code policies I've seen because it outlines the very important parts of your ethics code. It makes it sure that ethical conduct is more than simply following state law or local law. It also encourages everybody to avoid situations and maintain the highest personal values and standards. Um, the standards established by your ethics code are the minimum standard that you should be in effect. I will tell you, there is no such a thing as a perfect ethics code. There will always be situations where it's not addressed by the ethics code. But these standards will hopefully allow you to help make the correct decisions based on these standards. Now, your ethics code has ident identified several purposes. Next slide. Next slide. And these are some of the purposes that your ethics code was established for. To establish an ethics review commission. To improve public confidence in the integrity of government. To avoid conflicts. And that's probably one of the most important parts. Because if there's a conflict between your personal interest and your public responsibility, that's when city officials and public officials get themselves in trouble. When they start using their public position to personally gain themselves. Your code again establishes minimum standards of conduct to be adhered to by officers and employees. One of the major parts of your code is to require disclosure. A lot of things it does not prohibit a person from doing, but it requires you to report things and to disclose things. Um, also, it provides the process on how complaints would be uh, handled, how they, those complaints would be resolved, and then the possible penalties that you could receive as a result of those complaints. Now, who has to comply with the ethics code? Next slide. Well, it makes it very clear that officers of the city, your mayor and council members must comply. But the reason you're here at this session is because the ethics code must also be followed by members of all boards, commissions, and committees, including any member of a board that's simply an advisory capacity. There's a lot of ethics codes across the state where it doesn't apply to all boards and commissions. It only applies to those boards and commissions that have some power or some authority. And you'll see later on in this presentation where certain boards have to do other things than, than most boards, but the, right now, the one thing that I need to communicate is that everyone that's in attendance must comply with the city's ethics code. Next slide. It also applies to city employees, whether they're full time or part time. If you are a city employee, you as well must comply with this code. It even includes volunteers. Volunteers must also comply with the ethics code. Others that must comply with the ethics code. Next slide. And this is unique to a very few cities. Uh, it has code provisions that apply to former city officials, former city employees. It has rules and regulations for lobbyists. And it also, the code must, the candidates for public office must also comply with the ethics code. Next slide, please. So, one more. So, what's the first standard? Of Next slide. The most important and most common standard of conduct is improper economic benefit. 
I'm sorry, go back one. An official or employee shall not participate in making or influencing any city government decision or action in which they know they have any financial interest that's distinguishable from that of the public, general public. So, easy example. The mayor's brother is going to get a contract with the city. The mayor would not be able to participate. He could not in, be involved in that decision. That's the perfect example. But it also applies to employees. If you have an employee who's a food inspector, restaurant inspector, and he gets sent out to do an inspection, and all of a sudden he realizes it's his father-in-law's brand new restaurant that he was, you know, that uh, he has to inspect, he would not be able to do that inspection because it affects the financial interest of his father-in-law if he were to do that exception. And the perception would be bad anyway. Uh, so you have to be careful with those types of situations. Continuing with this one, next slide. Again, your standard of conduct says you shall not transact any business on behalf of the city with any entity in which they are officers, agents, or members or in which they have a financial interest. Now, two questions that come up with these two provisions, this provision and the previous one. What is distinguishable and what is financial interest? Well, one of the problems that I found in reviewing your ethics code, if you go to the next slide, Financial interest is not defined in your ethics code. Now, state law defines substantial interest. So my recommendation to the Ethics Review Commission when I did this presentation to them and to the city council was that they need to come up with a definition of financial interest to insert into their ethics code. But until they do that, they can use substantial interest as defined in state law to also mean financial interest in your ethics code. And what is substantial interest? If you own 10% or more of voting stock or shares in any business, you own 10% or more $15,000 of fair market value in the business, or if you receive more than 15,000 of the person's gross income from the previous year. Now, this is very important. This rule extends to officials, employees, relatives to the first degree by blood or marriage. So, taking this definition, let's talk about the mayor voting on his brother's contract. While the perception would be bad if he were to vote on it, under state law, his brother is not within the first degree by blood or marriage. First degree is a child or a parent. A brother or sister is second degree. So, by state law, it would not apply but by your local ordinance, that goes up to second degree, so you still would not be able to vote and participate on the matter. Now, can the contract still move forward? The answer is yes. Next slide. What the code requires and what state law requires is that the individual who has a conflict must file an affidavit with either the city clerk or the board secretary and state that they refrain from discussing and voting on the matter. Because if they have a conflict, they cannot participate. Now, again, your council files with the city, city clerk, your board members notify the board and also abstain from voting and refrain from discussing the matter. I've had many situations where the board member discusses it, is part of the discussion, and then when it comes to the vote, they abstain from the vote because they all of a sudden now announce, I have a conflict and can't vote. Well, you should not have been participating in the discussion either. The state law is very clear that you cannot further participate in any matter once you're aware that you have a conflict. Next slide. Another standard of conduct is improper economic benefit is the officer employee is not shall not participate in a decision in a matter if the person is negotiating employment with the entity seeking the business with the city. We have a rule very similar to that in the city of San Antonio ethics ordinance and we had an assistant city manager get himself in trouble by violating this rule. He was part of an evaluation team evaluating a contractor's proposal and at the same time he was evaluating that contractor's proposal 
he was also negotiating an employment contract with that entity. Clearly a violation of this rule that you cannot participate in any matter. You may not own the business. You may not be employed with the business right now. But if you're negotiating employment, the perception is going to be you're going to favor that evaluation or that contractor because you're negotiating employment with them. Decisions shall mean approval, disapproval, recommendation, investigation, rendering advice, and the term matter shall include but not limited to a proceeding application request. What this means is it's pretty general. If there is a substantial interest, if there is a financial interest, and it deals with any and it deals with any aspect of your official duties, you should recuse and not participate in the matter. Next slide. And you can actually skip this slide and go to the next one. The next standard of conduct is advancement of private interests. An official or employee may not use their position to secure privileges or exemptions for themselves, relatives or others. So let me give you an example. Let's say a company announces that they're moving to El Paso and they're going to have 500 jobs. And that company that's moving to El Paso is going to be looking for some economic incentives from the EDC or the city council. So then a member of the EDC or a member of the council contact that company and says, hey, I have a son who's needing a job. I would like for you to consider him for one of those 500 jobs. Clearly, you're using your position to advance uh, privileges to a relative of yourself because you know that that company may probably give your son a job because they know they're going to be seeking incentives from either yourself or the EDC. So that would be a violation. Also, a city official employee cannot give reasonable basis by their conduct that any person can improperly influence or unduly enjoy their favor. Someone tells you, I really need this, and you say, oh, I guarantee you, I'll get it through the city. Those are the types of things that official cannot do. Another example of advancement of private interest, is, next slide, is acquisition of interest in impending matters. Let's say that company, next slide, next say that company is saying they're going to buy property in South El Paso. Uh, and you know where they're buying the property, so you buy property around it to try to make a financial benefit. That would be an acquisition of interest in pending matters, which would be a violation. Also, you shall not knowingly perform or refuse to perform any act in order to deliberately thwart the execution of the city ordinance rules regulations. This standard of conduct is very unique to El Paso. Uh, I've not seen this standard of conduct in most other city ordin uh, ordinances. I found one city that had something similar. And in that instance, they actually had a case where this rule was violated. There was a council member who was refusing to allow a zoning case to move forward on a property. And the reason was was because the property owner had supported his opponent in his last campaign and would not allow the zoning to go through. Clearly, using their position to perform, refusing to perform an act, he should have allowed the zoning to go through and allowed for the council to vote it up or down, but he refused to even allow it to be placed on the agenda. Next slide. One of the more common areas where officials get in trouble is accepting gifts that they should not be accepted. Section 2.92040 of your ethics code outlines the gift provisions. Next slide. Your ethics code specifically says you may not solicit, accept, or agree to accept any gift for yourself or a relative from anybody if it exceeds $75 in value, any gift that you believe is given to you to reasonably tend to influence your actions uh, you cannot accept or any gift from a registered lobbyist worth more than $10 or more in value. So with registered lobbyists, it's $10 or less you may accept. Other folks, it's $75 or less. Now, there are exceptions. 
and your ethics code outlines those exceptions. For example, special occasions. Next slide. Um, when I was the city attorney of San Antonio, the mayor of San Antonio was getting married. And he was having a wedding. And he specific, specifically asked, Frank, do I have to list every gift I receive as a result of my wedding? And the answer was no. They also had an exception for special occasions. And as long as the gift was an appropriate wedding gift, it was okay, and he did not have to list it. Um, official duties. If you're invited to galas or to an event because of your official duties, and even, even though other people are paying $50, $100, $200 to attend that event, if you're specifically being invited because of your official city duties, you may accept that gift. And you'll have to disclose it, and we'll talk about that in a second, but you may accept that gift. You can also accept any gifts that are public awards, uh, any loans that are standard loans. It's not the developer gives you $500 or $10,000 and says, hey, pay me when you can. No. If you get a loan from a bank, you, of course, don't have to disclose it. Next slide. Other exceptions are campaign contributions. State law specifically allows, and your code ordinance specifically allows, can campaign contributions to not have to be listed. Now, you do have to disclose your campaign contributions, uh, but that's under the Texas Election Code and so forth. You can accept travel if it's related to your duties. I know of the San Antonio Airport Advisory Committee that received travel to a couple of airports across the country to look at a new uh, luggage system um, that they were looking to uh, replace in, in the San Antonio airport. So they went to go look at a couple of options that were available, and a couple of vendors paid for those trips. Again, they had to be disclosed, but they were allowed to accept them. You're also allowed to go uh, accept if you're invited to events because of your spouse, partner, or relative, friend, they invite you to an event and you're only going to the event because you're going with someone who was invited, that would be an exception and you do not have to disclose. You also may accept honorariums as long as it's compliant with your ethics code and state law. Next slide. And, and speaking of honorariums uh, or gifts, public servants who have discretion in contracts and other transactions commit a crime if they solicit, accept, or agree to accept any benefit from a person who has a contract or is interested in a future contract or any business transaction. In this instance, you don't have to receive that there was an exchange or that the person did something in return for the gift. By simply accepting the gift, it would be a problem. It would be a Class A misdemeanor. And again, you don't have to prove intent. Simply accepting the gift is a violation. Now, there are exceptions under this penal code. Next slide. Uh, an item of an item with a value of less than $50. Also, you do not have, you can accept any gift of any amount. Let me rephrase that. You can accept any gift of any amount under state law if by law or ordinance you are required to report those gifts. Remember, we're looking at 36.8, which is a state law. Uh, our legislators both state reps and state senators in Austin receive a lot of gifts. They're not prohibited gifts because they're required to report those gifts, whether it's entertainment, whether it's uh, uh, transportation. Um, they don't they can accept any amount as long as they report those gifts. So under state law, because you're certain individuals are required to report gifts, you could do that. But your ethics code limits the amount of gifts you may receive, and it requires disclosure of all sorts of gifts. In fact, under your ethics code, you're required to report all gifts over $10, travel expense and entertainment over $50, any award over $50, and any tickets to any event over $10. Well, we know 
that there's almost no event that's worth less than ten dollars. So if you're invited, you're going to have to disclose such tickets to that event. Next slide. Now, this is also something very unique to El Paso. Um, while most cities have gift reporting requirements, it's usually annually or quarterly. El Paso requires that you must report, if you get gifts every month, you must report them every month. Uh, it says each officer and designated employee shall keep a written record of all reportable gifts received during the term of office, and such records shall be made for each calendar month and submitted to the city clerk uh, no later than the 10th day of the following month. So, specifically, uh, it requires monthly reporting. If you were to get a gift every month, you would have to report it every month. Next slide. The next standard of conduct is confidential information. As a city official, you're going to receive confidential information. Most of that confidential information is going to occur in executive session. Specifically, you may not use your position to secure confidential information about any person for any purpose other than official duties. I'm aware of an individual who got themselves in trouble because they were able to access confidential information for personal use and not for the use of the position they were in. Also, an official employee shall not use or disclose confidential information. And again, confidential information is any information that would be accepted under the Public Information Act, as well as any information you may receive during an executive session. Next slide. It's also a crime under state law if you were to misuse public informa confidential information. A public servant commits a crime from, from using confidential information that they receive or gain a benefit or advantage for themselves or others. This is a third degree felony. And what are the elements for this crime? Next slide. You must be a public servant. Information must be confidential and information provided to the official because of the position. The only reason you receive that information is because you are a public official and then you use that information to aid yourself or another to acquire financial gain. Actual gain is not required. Speculation is enough. And let me give you an example. Uh, that company that I told you was moving into El Paso and bringing 500 jobs and confidentially you hear, you hear during an executive session where they're moving. And so you and a relative go and buy all the property near where their factory is moving. And then they never move there. Well, the mere fact is you try to take advantage of the information. The fact that they didn't move there still does not deviate from the fact you've committed a crime. Next slide. Use of city resources. This is also prohibited and use of city resources for personal or private gain. An officer employee shall not utilize city resources or allow city resources to be utilized for personal benefit for the personal benefit of any person or entity. This includes using city resources for political purposes. We had a city council member in San Antonio get himself in trouble because he was using the city computer to keep track of all of his campaign uh, contributions. Next slide. It's also a criminal statute if you were to misuse government property. 39.02. Next slide. The law specifically says that a public servant commits a crime if he knowingly misuses government property, which includes services, personnel, or any other thing of value belonging to the government. Now, if I had you in person, I would ask you to raise your hand if you've ever seen the movie Shawshank Redemption, one of my favorite movies. Clearly, if you've seen that movie, the prison warden was misusing prison personnel to get government contracts and then benefiting from the funds. Misusing of, of personnel is just as bad as misusing property and so forth. That clearly, if that occurred in Texas, would have been a violation of this penal code prohibition. Next slide. 
Again, the misuse of property is a serious violation of public trust. Uh, it occurs when an official uses property contrary to an agreement for holding the property, a contract of employment or oath, a law that prescribes custody or disposition. I know of a deputy sheriff who, under the law, when you're disposing of weapons, it specifically identifies the process you're supposed to utilize for disposing of weapons. Well, this individual, this deputy sheriff, was an anti-gun collector. And once in a while, there would be an anti-gun that would go through the process that he was required by law to dispose of. Well, he didn't dispose it. He said he did, did not, and kept them. And so eventually, when he was showing off his antique gun collection to his colleagues, it was discovered that he had kept some of those guns he was supposed to have disposed of and lost his job and his pension. Next slide. Another standard of conduct, and this really applies just to city employees and to the council members. It specifically says that council members and employees shall not personally represent or appear on behalf of any person, group, or entity before the any city board, before the council, uh, if the representation is adverse to the city, whether it's a judicial proceeding or quasi-judicial proceeding. So if you have a, a, a council member who's an attorney, he cannot represent a private client against the city's interest. Clear. Also, uh, this does not include testifying in court in response to a subpoena or speaking before board or council on behalf of a constituent. Now, again, this applies only to city employees and to council members. The next slide does apply to all boards and commissions. This specifically says that the official who is a member of a city board or commission shall not represent any person, group, or entity before that board or body, before city staff of that board, or before the council, unless the board member identifies themselves as a board member. Example, let's say you are on the El Paso Zoning Commission, and your neighbor wants you to represent him before the Zoning Commission, and you do. That's a violation of this matter. You cannot represent, because you're a member of that body, you cannot represent anyone else. You can't talk to the staff that works with the Zoning Commission trying to help your neighbor out. And you cannot appear before the City Council unless you identified yourself as a more board member of that commission. Next slide. This also applies to boards and commissions that you shall not personally provide services for compensation directly or indirectly to a person or organization who is requesting an approval, investigation, or determination from the body or department of which the officer employee is a member. Same exact situation. Zoning member cannot represent someone for compensation to try to get the zoning commission to rule in their favor or to the staff that works with the zoning commission. And this does not apply to outside employment of an officer. The employment is the officer's primary source of income and would require recusal and filing of an affidavit by that officer. The next slide really applies mostly to employees, uh, but it, I have seen it apply to certain officials. Official employee cannot engage in outside employment that is incompatible with their duties or impairs independence or judgment. I've really not seen this with boards and commissions. I've seen it with employees and city council members, elected officials, not really with appointed board members. Next slide. Also, you cannot receive any fee or compensation for your services as officers or employees of the city from any source other than the city, except as may otherwise be provided by law. This is very identical to the state honorarium provision. And so what this basically means, and I'll give you an example, the city manager. Uh, the city manager has just uh, presented the budget to the city council for approval, and the chamber of commerce invites the city manager to make a presentation on the city budget. And the, ch city, uh, the chamber were to pay the city manager $500 for that presentation. 
the manager would not be able to accept that $500 because it would be a violation of this provision because uh, he is doing his city duties and responsibilities and he's being paid by an outside entity to perform his city duties and responsibilities. And again, this is identical to honorarium, which is the next slide. And this is a criminal violation. And again, it says that a city official employee commits an offense if the public service elicits or accepts or agrees to accept a honorarium in consideration for services that the public servant would not have been would not have been requested to provide, but for the public servant's official position or duties. So again, the example I gave you, the city manager would not have been asked to make a presentation on the city's budget to the chamber, but for the fact he was the city manager. Um, now, this does not prohibit from accepting transportation and lodging expenses in connection with a conference or similar event in which the official employee addresses an audience or participates in a seminar. So let's take that city manager example. While he can't get paid to perform or provide the, the, the chamber, the budget process that he, or the budget that's upcoming for the city, if he wants to attend the International City Managers Association in Denver and they pay for his expenses to go up there to explain to other city managers the process he uses to develop budgets, that would be okay. That would not be a violation of the honorarium. Next slide, please. Now, this next provision applies only to employees, and I've actually told both the Ethics Review Commission and the City Council that I don't believe this is appropriate for an ethics code, because it says city employees shall not recklessly disregard the established practices or policies of the city relating to the duties assigned to the employee. Well, all employees for the city eventually work for the city manager. So this really should be addressed by the personnel rules that if a city employee is not doing their job or recklessly doing their duties, it should be handled by personnel rules and not an ethics code. So I've actually made a recommendation that they eliminate this provision because it is not applicable to anybody else but city employees. If this was a standard of conduct that applied to elected and appointed officials, uh, that might be okay, but for it applying for city employees, I think it's more appropriate to be handled by your personnel rules. That covers the standards of conduct for current officials, but there's also standards of conduct for former city officials and employees. Next slide. These rules are kind of sometimes called revolving door rules. And what they do is they prohibit former elected and appointed officials, as well as former employees, from using their previous position for personal gain. How would someone use it for personal gain? Well, they could utilize confidential information they learned as a public employee or public official. They could take advantage of previous contacts. You, become a, you could be, immediately become a lobbyist. If you were a former council member or a council member, you Two days after you left office, you start lobbying council and staff. You're taking advantage of the contacts that you used and you made while you were a council member. It also prohibits prior participation. So let's go to confidential information. Next slide. This is the rule that lasts forever as long as that confidential information is confidential. The rule basically states that you must maintain confidentiality indefinitely. So as long as the information you learned as a city official is still confidential, you must remain it as confidential. Now, if it becomes public by the news or another official, then that requirement of you keeping it confidential is no longer applicable. Uh, but again, if it does not become confidential, this is the one rule that can last for years and years is the information you learned as a city official must be maintained confidential. Next slide. And then there's the 24 month situation. City officers and employees shall not engage in lobbying activities before the city for 24 months after leaving city service lobbying activities, and we'll talk more about what lobbying is, 
So what this basically says that if you are a city officer or a city employee, you cannot lobby for up to 24 months. You may rep represent any other person or organization in any formal or informal appearance before the council or any city board or department. If you want to show up as a citizen three months after you're out of office and raise issues or concerns that you have, that's fine. But you may not represent any other person or organization in any formal or informal appearance. Again, the prohibition pertaining to appearances before the council or a city board or department does not apply to a foreign board member unless that foreign board member is appearing before the board they serve. So, again, your zoning commissioner, for two years, you cannot appear before that zoning commission if you're representing someone else. Next slide. And again, that's basically what I talk about here is that a foreign board member shall not represent any person, group, or entity for 24 months after the end of their duties before that board or city staff that works with that board and before the council related to those board duties. Zoning commission, again, for 24 months after you're no longer a zoning commissioner, you may not represent anyone else. You can represent yourself, but not any other person, group, or entity before that board, before city staff that works with the zoning commission, and again, before city council, if it's a zoning commission matter. Next slide. This slide really applies only to civil service commission. I don't believe we have any civil service commission members uh, online. I think we've already done the training for them, so I'm going to skip this slide and go to the next one. Campaign finance regulations. This applies if you ever intend to run for office. I know many of you uh, are not ever intending to run for office, but if there are some boards or commission members who are thinking of running for office, then these rules would apply to you. The council adopted these in 2006 to make additional disclosure requirements more than what's required by the Texas election code. The provisions of this section pertain to candidates for city office. Now, let me make that very clear. Let's say you are already a, let's say you are a city commissioner of a board, but you're not running for a city office. You're running for county commissioner or you're running for state rep. These rules would not apply to you. These rules only apply if you are running for an office of the city. That basically means mayor or council member. And the rules are that if you are a candidate uh, and you, or if you're currently a council member and you receive more than $500 or more from a contributor after the date they last filed a finance report, that can, council member must disclose uh, that amount before any vote or deliberation regarding the contributor. Also, it is prohibited for any individual who's running for city office to take any money from in, next slide from any adverse party in any pending litigation against the city or who has an ownership interest of 10 percent or more in any entity that is an adverse party to any pending litigation so if you're running for office and you were to receive a thousand dollars from someone who is suing the city you are prohibited from accepting those dollars now, the lawsuit must be seeking recovery of amount in excess of damages of $25,000 or more. Um, the candidate would have to return the contribution within 10 days after becoming aware and being notified of the litigation. Next is financial disclosure. Next slide. This only applies to city council members. And I know I don't have any city council members currently present, but the city charter, not the ethics code, the charter requires council members to disclose the, what's listed on this slide on an annual basis. As you'll, as we see in a few slides, this is the same information that certain boards and commissions also have to disclose as a result of the financial disclosure report. Next slide. The following individuals must file financial disclosure reports. These officials, excluded mayor and council, because again, mayor and council have to comply with the charter. 
the following officials of these boards commissions must file financial disclosure reports. Your Building and Standards Commission, your City Plan Commission, your Civil Service Commission, your Construction Board of Appeals, your Ethics Review Commission, your Historic Landmark Commission, your Parks and Recreation Board, your Public Service Board, and your Zoning Board of Adjustment. These boards and commissions must fill out financial disclosure reports. If you're on another board or commission, you do not have to fill them out. Next slide. Also, city employees must fill out financial disclosure reports. Your city manager, your deputy city manager, the department heads, uh, executive assistants to the mayor. Also, each candidate for elected office must file financial disclosure reports, as well as each candidate for one of those appointment positions. For example, I decide to apply for city attorney. I'm a department that would make me a department head for the city. I would have to fill out the financial disclosure report. And you must file them within 10 days of appointment and between June 1st and June 30th of every year. Next slide. What happens? Uh, also, this is the information that you must disclose uh, in your financial disclosure report. It's identical to what the mayor and council have disclosed per the charter. You have to identify your employment and your spouse's or partner's employment, your membership on all boards of directors, partnership interest and spouse's interest, any business in which the officer or spouse has a financial interest, and then property ownership of the official and the spouse. Those are all information you must disclose in your financial disclosure report. Next slide. What happens if you don't file your financial disclosure report? Well, if you're a Civil Service Commission member and a Board of Adjustment member, the council notifies you regarding possible removal. If you're a Public Service Board, council notified regarding possible removal but must be consistent with the bond, bond indenture for removal purposes. If you're a Housing Finance Corporation member, city notifies you regarding possible removal and that removal must be consistent with the bylaw, board bylaws of the Finance Corporation. And then all other boards and commissions, the members shall have been deemed removed from office without any further action. So if you're not on one of those three or four previous boards just mentioned, you're on another board that's required to fill a financial disclosure report and you fail to file it by the deadline and after you've been giving notice, you are basically deemed removed from office without any further action or review by the city council. Next standard of conduct applies to lobbyists. And there aren't many cities that have rules of conduct for lobbyists. San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, and El Paso, I know for sure, have rules for lobbyists for city lobbyists. And your, your ethics code defines lobbying as any communication to a city official made by any person in an effort to influence or persuade an official to favor or oppose, recommend, vote for, or against, or take refrain from taking action on a municipal question. Now, it does not include comments that a lobbyist might make in a posted public meeting. It only requires communications to city officials. So which city officials? Next slide. It specifically says all elected officials, your city manager, and your board members of the following boards and commissions. Your Building Board of Appeals, your Building and Standards Commission, your Civil Service Commission, your Public Service Board, your Historic Landmark Commission, your City Plan Commission, your Zoning Board of Adjustment, and then Retirement Boards. So if you're on one of these boards and a lobbyist is trying to contact you or meets with you, that lobbyist has to report those contacts. If a lobbyist is meeting or trying to meet with a board or commission that's not listed on this slide, they're not required to identify and disclose that they met with those person. It's only the individuals on this slide that they're required to report. Now, again, it applies, lobbying applies to municipal questions. Next slide. And a municipal question is a public policy issue of a discretionary nature pending or impending before the council or board 
or commission identified in the form of ordinances, motions, recommendations, reports, policies, appointments, and bids. A lobbyist is going to lobby an individual on that list in order to try to persuade them to vote a certain way. And if it deals with ordinances, motions, recommendations, and things, they have to identify themselves a lobbyist. And what does the lobbyist have to do? Next slide. They have to register. They have to register with the city that they are a registered lobbyist. And again, the city's not prohibiting lobbying. They're simply requiring disclosure of lobbyist activities. Lobbyists have to pay a hundred dollar annual fee to register as a lobbyist. They have if uh, they have to register as a lobbyist if they receive compensation of more than two hundred dollars per quarter. If they spend to more than two hundred dollars for lobbying purposes, if they receive reimbursement of more than two hundred dollars for lobbying purposes, and they're required to register within two business days of commencing lobbying, and then they're required to do an annual registration and fee. Next slide. There are exceptions to lobbyists that don't have to register as lobbyists. Your neighborhood associations. Your governmental entities, and yes, there are governmental entities that lobby other governmental entities. Uh, they would not have to register as lobbyists. Attorney, if an attorney is practicing law, he does not have to register as a lobbyist. Now, let me give you an example. Um, if an attorney is wanting to meet with the city attorney or the city manager or the mayor about a lawsuit against the city of El Paso, that's an attorney in the practice of law. And so they don't have to register as a lobbyist. However, if an attorney is wanting to meet with a department director to try to get his client to get a contract, that's lobbying. And that person would have to register as a lobbyist because that's not the practice of law, trying to get his client and the contract award. Next slide. Lobbyists are required to file certain reports. They have to be filed quarterly. And this reports have to list the issues they're lobbying on behalf of their client. They have to list the officials that they're contacting, whether they're employees or elected or appointed officials. They have to list their employees and agents who are also lobbying on their behalf. They have to list any gifts they've been giving, they have given to any city officials or uh, employees. They have to list their expenditures on behalf of lobbying. And then once they fill these quarterly reports and activity reports, they are subject to the Public Information Act. A citizen can request a copy of these reports. There are the next slide. There are certain activities that are restricted from lobbyists. They may not give gifts of more than ten dollars. Uh, that it says no gifts unless compliant with ethics code. And I went over the provision that said under the gift provision that no lobbyist may give a gift of more than $10. Lobbyists shall not represent that they can control or obtain the vote or action of any city official. Uh, lobbyists can't say, yeah, he's in my pocket, I can control or I can get the vote you need. May not appear before council or staff without identifying themselves as a lobbyist or a city official of those boards or commissions. They have to, if they're gonna meet with the city council member or a staff member or one of those members of those boards commissions, they have to identify themselves as lobbyists and identify who they're representing. May not lobby council members during an RFP or discretionary solicitation unless done during a public meeting. And then if you're a lobbyist, you are not eligible to serve on any board or commission. The there are penalties for lobbyists for violating the, the code. Uh, if they knowingly, next slide, knowingly or intentionally lobby in violation of the code, like failing to identify themselves or failing to register, then they could be found guilty of a misdemeanor under your ethics code. Also, if they're representing a contractor and they violate the code by not registering as a, as a lobbyist or meeting with people without uh, putting in their quarterly reports and they're representing a contractor, that contractor could be uh, forfeited from entering into a contract for up to a period of not to exceed three years. So the contractor would be the one that loses out. And with that, uh, that completes my presentation on the ethics code for the city of El Paso. 
Uh, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions any of you may have with regards to the presentation. And with that, I'll shut up and see if anybody has any questions. If you have any questions, um, please raise your hand from the chat so I can acknowledge your uh, your questions, please. Do we have any questions at this time? Okay, so then we're going to continue with the presentation from Ms. Diana Nunez on the Code of Conduct. Diana, are you ready? Yes, ma'am. Let me go ahead and share my presentation with you all. And then let me know if the screen is split like you mentioned earlier. Give me one second. Is the is the screen showing fine or? It's showing the presentation, but it's not split. You have to um, share your desktop. Yes, and I did that and I went into the setup. OK, I will do that again. Give me one second. Let me try it again. You, I think you're sharing your PowerPoint. There's another option to share your entire desktop. Exactly, and I am sharing the desktop. Is it is it split now or not yet? No, not yet. If you if you want me to, I can do it for you. So I know what you're talking about, sir. So the the thing is, what we're using it works a little bit different. So if you want me to, I can run it for you and do exactly what we did just a little while ago. Do you want me to do that? You're talking to me, Diana? Y yes. Do you want me to do the same thing I did for Mr. Frank? Yeah, sure. Because I've already, I followed the instructions you gave me and I am sure. I, I, know, I, know, what, I know what he's saying. Yes, but, but yeah. it's, it's a little bit weird. So let me just do it this way, okay? And okay. you can just tell me next slide. Go ahead and start speaking and see who. Yeah, so you can see the captions right here at the bottom. So this is good to go. Okay. Uh, can can yes. you guys see my, my captions? Yes, we can see the captions. Thank okay. you, Alex right. and Diana. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. So good. Good afternoon, everyone. First, I want to thank you for your time and your service that you volunteered to all the boards and commissions. We couldn't be the wonderful city that we are without your input, your community input. You represent the entire community and we thank you for your service. Uh, this is a great seg segue after the ethics ordinance. Since the code of conduct complements the, the ethics ordinance, it doesn't necessarily replace it replaces it, but it's a, a good compliment. Just to give you a little bit of history, uh, City Council adopted the Code of Conduct in June of uh, 2019, as you all know, for elected officials and appointed officials. And then it was revised in January 2020. And uh, board members are considered appointed officials. Next slide, please. So this is the mission, vision, and values. I'm not going to read them out to you, but it, this is our framework, and it guides us in providing exceptional customer service to the community and achieving the goals in our strategic plan. And again, as a, appointed officials and board members, you play an integral part in our mission. Next slide, please. This particular presentation is going to fall under the City of El Paso's uh, goal five and six of the strategic plan, 
which is to promote transparent, consistent communication among all members of the community and to set the standard for sound governance and fiscal management. Next slide. I'm going to give you a little rundown of what our agenda is going to look like. First, we're going to discuss what is a code of conduct and its importance. Then we're going to move on to who it does it apply to. We'll cover the five pillars of conduct and the impact in the work environment and your board meetings. And then we'll do the we'll go over the conduct protocols between yourself as a board member with one another in a public and a private setting with city staff with the public in both in a public and in, in an unofficial setting with other public agencies with other elected and appointed officials and with the media and then we'll go over just a couple of strategies to address issue what do you need to do to address issues when you're having issues with an employee or with another fellow board member and then at the very end, we'll, we'll play a video that it pretty much summarizes everything. It's more tailored for the employees and the elected officials, but there are some of the points that overlap. And it talks a little bit about board and committee members. And we'll wrap it up with that. It's a 13 minute video. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Next slide, please. So let's begin by defining what a code of conduct is. And bottom line, it's behavioral standards of conduct that apply to all members of the organization. And as I mentioned before, you as a committee board member serving our boards, you are part of the city of El Paso family and we're here to provide service to the community. It's, uh, it directs and guides all members of the organization on what is expected out of their conduct. What is the engagement between, what should be the engagement protocol between board members? What about board members with elected officials or with staff and the public? And, uh, and it makes us responsible and gives us accountability for our actions and our behavior. Next slide, please. Large and small cities, the military, large businesses have all adopted code of conduct. The, these organizations recognize that the behavior of their employees can have a positive or negative effect on their brand. And in our case, in the city's reputation, this is why it's so important for the city of El Paso to have a code of conduct policy. And as board members, your personal conduct and behavior is not only a reflection of who you are. Next slide, I'm sorry. It's not only a reflection of who you are as an individual, but also a reflection of the organization. So it's imperative that we are always polite and respectful and professional at all times. We have to work together and as board members, it's particularly important that we work not for any private or personal interest and that we are fair and equal to everybody in the organization and the public. The public and the media holds you at a higher standard. The minute they know that you're a board member in some city board, they hold you at a higher standard and they're gonna scrutinize everything you do and, and you say. And with this said, it can make or break an organization. So the code of conduct is gonna establish protocols that will help you avoid conflicts between personal interest and public responsibilities. Next slide, please. So how does it help our city? It helps us with our core values. It fosters leaders and employees and also board members. It helps us by supporting the day-to-day -day operations and giving us, empowering us to make decisions. And it sets a high standard and proper conduct. Next slide, please. 
some of the benefits of a code of conduct. Highlights our values, highlights our culture. It enhances our reputation and it keeps us mindful of what the behavioral standards should be. But above all, as a municipality, it helps us foster public confidence. That is very important and very different than what the private sector can be at times. Next slide. So failure to, behave, to adhere to our behavioral standards can breed hostility. It can also damage the city's reputation as we stated before. And again, above all, builds distrust. We already mentioned how important it is that we have public confidence. Everyone is watching you, as I mentioned before, and we see it on TV all the time when companies are looking to establish operations in other cities. They look at their elected officials, at their appointed officials, the harmony in the community before they even consider that city to move. And if we don't have a good code of conduct, we risk losing a business opportunity, as I mentioned, because everybody is watching what, what we're doing. So we know our behavior has positive and negative effects. And because of this, it applies to everyone in the organization to include our board members. Next slide. Next slide, please. I'm sorry. So as I mentioned, it applies to everybody in the, in the organization, elected officials and appointed officials, our board committee members. So we're all a reflection of the organization. So what are the standards of conduct that we should be following? Next slide, please. This is the five pillars of conduct, and I'm going to just briefly go through every single point. Comply with federal, state, and municipal laws, such as the ethics ordinance that we just got a briefing on. Maintain an open mind and base your decisions and actions on the facts presented and the law. The third point, confidential information shall never be disclosed without proper legal authorization or be used to advance personal, financial, or other private interest. Point number four, we have a city manager form of government who establishes the processes and we have to respect that. And number five, support and maintain a professional workplace environment and professional board meetings, abusive conduct, personal and verbal attacks are not acceptable. It is imperative to uphold the values of the city and create a positive percep perception at all times with staff, businesses, and the community. Next slide, please. So what is your conduct? What should be your conduct with one another in a public meeting? In your case, a board meeting. That's the perfect example. Well, the first point, keep in mind that criticism of ideas and expression of different points of view are legitimate elements of a free democracy in action. So please practice professionalism. The second point, no shouting or physical actions that could be misconstrued construed as threatening will be tolerated. If you're going to be uh, discussing having a discussion at the board meeting attack the issue not the person the third point maintain focus on the agenda item being discussed during your board meetings the chairperson is the person to maintain the decorum fourth point this is the stage for many different points of view so find common ground and seek a compromise that benefits the community. And last but not least, be respectful of everyone's time. Next slide. Now we're going to cover. Next slide, please. Thank you.
Now we're going to cover your conduct. Oh, the previous one. Can you go back? Sorry. Thank you. Now we're going to cover your conduct with one another, but in a private setting, which ultimately shouldn't be any different than, than in a public setting. You should maintain respect and professional communications. Second point, you should be treated, you should be treated as potent. Any conversation that you're having should be treated as potentially public communication. I know with all the technology that we have nowadays, sometimes it's very easy to use the 150 characters on a tweet or social media and not put too much thought on what we're writing, but you have to be very cautious on what you post and be always aware that any type of communication can be public at any time and is subject to the Texas Public Information Act, even in a private setting. And the third point, officials are always on display, their actions, their mannerisms. So any conversation that you might be having after a board meeting and you're having a conversation informally in the hallway, in the elevator, in the parking lot, you have to keep in mind that it might become public communication or even in a lunch setting where you uh, inadvertently start talking about an issue that was discussed in a board meeting you have to always be aware, aware that it can be, be it can become public at any time next slide please This is your conduct with city, with city staff. So we ask that you always remain cooperative and that you show mutual respect. Recognize and respect the city's organizational structure ultimately. So the first point, if you request any information, if you have any questions, you should direct it to the designated staff member that's assigned to that particular boarding committee. The second point, have a clear, honest communication that respects staff, you know, respect their experience. Disrespectful behavior towards staff is not acceptable. The third point, be respectful of staff's time. The fourth one, refrain from making personal attacks. Fifth, comments and concerns about staff performance should be brought up with the city manager. Employees are under his, his direction. Just keep that in mind. And the last bullet, it's uh, just follow the process and the, the city's organizational structure. The city manager is who directs all city employees. Next slide, please. So now this is your conduct with the public in a public setting. So going back to those board meetings, um, if you have members of the public that show up, the first point says be welcoming to speakers. It can be very nerve wracking for a member of the public to show up to the podium at a board meeting and speak up. And, it, and you will put them at ease if you are friendly to them, if you're welcoming them to the meeting and listening to them, instead of um, pushing them away and their emotions can get to a higher level of intensity if we don't make them feel comfortable. Remember that, um, and I think this is an important point to make, many of the decisions that the city makes and the boards affect their daily lives, their homes, and so therefore they can become very emotional. So putting them at ease is very important in this democratic process that we have. Be fair and equitable in allowing them to speak. I'm not sure what the rules are for boards and committees, but just giving the example of the city's, uh, city council meetings, if you're gonna have three minutes per speaker, make sure you're equitable to everybody or allow them to just 
come up to the podium if they have a new point or to designate a speaker. Those are just some of the examples so that we can respect their points of view. Be an active listener. We're humans. We like that special eye contact so that we feel that we're being heard. So not looking around or looking as if we're bored with their discussion would be inappropriate. The fourth point, ask for clarification. The best thing I can say here is remember that the chair controls the board meeting and maintains the decorum. It is never appropriate to be belligerent, to challenge or belittle a speaker. Be aware of your body language, your tone of voice, the words you use. It could come across as intimidating or aggressive. And the last point, we follow the Roberts Rules of Order. Usually you have an attorney and the secretary for that particular board. Use them if you have any questions on your parliamentary procedure. Next slide, please. And this is your conduct with the public in an unofficial setting. Pretty much maintain the same decorum. It is inappropriate to give a brief overview of a city policy. If you are asked or, or just make sure you refer them to the staff, to the city staff. Board members sometimes are asked to explain a city action. We ask that you refer them to the mayor and council or to the city staff for further information. And refrain from making personal comments about other appointed officials, other board members, other elected officials, derogatory comments about their opinions and actions are unacceptable. Next slide, please. This would be your conduct with other public agencies. Be clear about representing the city or personal interest. And this is just a reminder that the mayor represents the city in inter intragovernmental and intergovernmental relationships. The third point, be always very clear when you're stating your opinion or if you're stating the city's position. Why am I saying this? Because even when it is your opinion, it could be interpreted as the city's position. So we ask that you're extremely clear at that. Next slide, please. This is appointed officials conduct with other appointed official conduct, appointed officials or an elected official in this case. So this would be the conduct between you as a board member and an elected official. First, again, like I mentioned before, we value your, your expertise. And the city has established the boards and committees for that to get input, to gather community input and tap into your expertise as a board member. By serving on a board committee, you are an advisor to the mayor and council. And we use you as a valuable resource and, um, and we value your expertise. So with that, we should be treating each other with appreciation and respect. The third point, although not prohibited, board members' attendance at other city board or committee meetings is discouraged based on the effect that your presence may have on some of the proceedings during these meetings. It could have an adverse uh, effect. And last point, do not lobby on behalf of any individual business or developer. That is inappropriate. Next slide, please. This is appointed officials conduct with other elected officials or other appointed officials. 
Again, board committee members report to the mayor and city council and not to individual council members. Very important to clarify that. So do not ever feel threatened about an elected official removing you because you disagree about an issue with them. This is not, this should not be considered as a political reward an appointment to a board and committee or committee. And again, the primary role of boards and committees is to represent the many views, the many point of views in the community. And you provide advice to the entire mayor and city council. Therefore, elected officials must be fair and respectful to all citizens serving our boards and committees. And again, we respect you and we respect your expertise. Next slide. Conduct with the media. So I know the media at times can come in and approach you and ask you for a comment. Never say no comment. What you should be doing is uh, directing them to the board or, board or committee's assigned staff member or to the city's public affairs office. Short and sweet. Next slide, please. So we realize that there might be some issues at times, and this would address issues with an employee issues you might be having as a board member with an employee. First of all, we ask that you notify the city manager and that is the one thing you should be doing. Notifying the city manager and the city manager would handle it through the set process that they have. Remember that any performance or other issues you might have with that with staff members just should be brought up to the city managers directly. Next slide. So this will be addressing issues with one another. If you're having issues with another board member, first we ask that you discuss it with your fellow member. If the behavior continues, then inform the chair. In turn, the chair will then inform the assigned staff member to that committee who will then turn around and inform the mayor. If it is the chair's behavior, behavior that's in question, then the members, the staff member will then inform the mayor about the misconduct. And then the mayor will ultimately address the issue directly with that board member. Next slide, please. If the misbehavior continues, what are the consequences? Well, city council may remove the member from office, but it takes a majority of vote of city council <clears throat> for any type of discipline. Next slide, please. Should I try playing the video IT or are you gonna try that? Because we're at no, the point. I can, do it. I can do it for you. Perfect. Thank you. So what you're going to see next is again that video I mentioned earlier. It's a summary on the importance of the code of conduct, and it highlights some of the points that, that we just covered. It is an overview of the expectations and behavioral standards and how our behavior reflects the city of El Paso. It's about 13 minutes, and then with that, we'll just come back and do a recap, and we should be done. We can't, we don't have any audio. Give me one second. Okay, thank you. There you go, perfect. As public employees, our personal conduct and behavior is not only a reflection of who we are as individuals, but it's also a reflection of the city of El Paso. 
I'm Kerry Weston, Deputy City Manager, yeah. and I want to welcome all of you to our training today on the City of El Paso Code of Conduct for Employees and Volunteers. The values of our city, yeah. integrity, yeah. respect, yeah. excellence, accountability, and people aren't just words on a piece yeah. of paper. No, they represent who we are as an organization and what we stand for. They're a declaration of what we believe in, and they're the foundation for how we operate. Most importantly, and put simply, our values state explicitly what's expected in any interaction with an employee or representative of the city. From these values and focusing upon the need for us to always conduct ourselves in accordance with these values, we've adopted and developed a code of conduct for the city of El Paso. Essentially, a code of conduct is a framework or guideline of standards on the expectations for how we should behave and interact with others as individuals in our organization. It establishes consistent standards and expectations for how we engage with each other and how we engage with the public. Certainly for our code of conduct to be successful, we need to own it as a key aspect of our mission, vision, and values and we are all responsible to self-police to ensure that we adhere to the behavioral standards. It's currently becoming very common to see codes of conduct being adopted across many organizations, particularly those that have significant engagement with the public. Large, enduring organizations like our U.S. Armed Forces have operated under a code of conduct for over 64 years when it was established in 1955 by President Eisenhower. Large, recognizable businesses like Google, Starbucks, the Coca-Cola Company, and many others have adopted codes of conduct because they recognize that the behavior of their employees can have both a positive and negative effect on their brands. Operating under a code of conduct benefits our city in many ways. It demonstrates what we value and highlights our organizational culture. It enhances our reputation by treating each other and others with dignity and respect. It keeps behavioral standards top of mind, and it fosters an environment of trust. It's important to note that the Code of Conduct is not a replacement for the Ethics Ordinance. In fact, it's complementary to the Ethics Ordinance. The City Ethics Ordinance clearly defines ethical issues and questions of right and wrong, and the Code of Conduct is a directional document that reinforces our values and expectations for how we should behave. Our Code of Conduct applies to all representatives of the City of El Paso. This includes our elected officials, both mayor and council, appointed officials who serve as members of our boards and committees, and all city employees uh, and volunteers. No, the, the city of El Paso is organized as a council manager form of government that combines the strong political leadership that serves as the city's primary legislative body and the city manager who directs and oversees city staff uh, in executing the day-to-day -day municipal operations as well as enforcing the council's policies and legislative initiatives. As you review the document, take some time to understand the various roles of the key members of the organization. Their roles and responsibilities are further outlined in the document. Code of Conduct is centered on five easy-to-remember pillars of conduct. One, comply with the spirit and letter of the law and city policy. In other words, obey the law and follow established city policies. Two, make decisions and act on facts. Don't make decisions on hearsay or gossip. Three, never disclose confidential information. Four, respect the city organizational process. In particular, remember that we take direction from the city manager change and five, maintain a positive workplace environment. This is the centerpiece of our code of conduct. Our ability to successfully do our jobs and achieve great results goes hand in hand with good teamwork, developing strong interpersonal relationships, and how we treat each other. Always treat your coworkers with dignity and respect. Understand that their views and positions on tasks and objectives aren't always going to align with what you want or how you are thinking. It's okay to disagree, but attack the issue, not the person. Making belligerent, threatening, personal, or demeaning comments is never okay, 
and runs counter to our core values and the positive working environment that we expect within the city of El Paso. Look to approach each issue with the goal of doing what's best for our community and in doing so, be respectful and professional with others. As a city staff, our duties and responsibilities often require us to interact with city elected officials and those that are appointed to boards and committees. No different than how we expect to treat each other. It's important to be polite, respectful, and professional at all times with our elected and appointed officials. By city charter, we as city staff members work under an operational chain of command led by the direction of our city manager. It's important that if you're requested or directed individually to do something by an elected official, that request should be politely directed to your immediate supervisor and through our established council request process. Any specific requests or questions that come from appointed board or committee members should be directed to the designated city staff member assigned as the lead to the specific board or committee. Following and not deviating from our established city processes is critical for good governance and will positively impact our ability to be responsive to the needs of our city council and our board's interests. Again, our code of conduct not only applies to city employees, it also applies to our elected officials. You should expect that our elected officials treat city staff as professionals and disrespectful behavior is not acceptable. Our elected and appointed officials should not disrupt city staff while they're engaged in performing their duties and responsibilities. Our elected officials should never publicly criticize staff nor should they vocalize concerns regarding staff performance to the individual employee or to his or her supervisor. Any comments or concerns regarding performance should be made directly to the city manager. Elected officials should never use their position to influence position appointments, contract awards, the selection of consultants, processing development applications, or granting city licenses and appointments. Our city charter under Article 5 specifically addresses what is prohibited in terms of influence by elected officials in regards to administrative appointments. Any elected official request for staff support must be directed to the city manager who is responsible for allocating city resources. We serve the citizens of El Paso and much of what we do as city staff involves direct engagement with the public. How we interact directly reflects on the city, so it's important to be polite, respectful, and professional at all times with members of the community. Actively listen when you're engaging with community members. Remember, their issues are important to them and often impact their everyday lives. Be aware of your body language and facial expressions and how they may be interpreted. And most importantly, do your very best to assist and resolve issues, but don't make promises on behalf of the city. Communicating with the media is an effective way to deliver the facts and appropriate message to the citizens of El Paso. That said, avoid off-the-record conversations and always be professional. If you receive a request to speak with the media, notify your immediate supervisor and contact your designated public affairs coordinator for additional guidance. Also, get media contact information to ensure a prompt and response. Now, he's putting a piece of paper. An equally important aspect in complying with the Code of Conduct is how we address code violations when they occur. Our overall intent is to work on resolving issues at the lowest possible level. 
The first step should be directly addressing the individual exhibiting the inappropriate behavior and letting them know that their behavior is unacceptable. Um, Oftentimes, inappropriate behavior can be resolved by discussing the situation immediately. Uh, if their behavior continues, notify your immediate supervisor. Your supervisor will handle conduct issues as detailed in our city employee relations process. So, If a code of conduct issue occurs from an elected official, notify your supervisor immediately, who will then notify the appropriate deputy city manager. From a process standpoint, the DCM will notify the city manager and mayor regarding the issue. If it is the mayor's behavior that's in question, the mayor pro tem will address the issue. If the conduct issue is still not resolved, the item may be brought to the body of the council for discussion and appropriate action. Keeping our code of conduct top of mind will serve as well as the city in maintaining both a positive and professional workplace environment for all of our employees. Remember, abusive conduct and inappropriate behavior is never okay and not acceptable. In the event that you require additional assistance, you may also call the employee relations or employee hotline using the phone number shown on the screen. We're hearing some feedback. Can you mute your microphone, please? Give me one second. Let me pause the video because I think if I mute, you guys are going to not hear the, the video. One second. Employees, and we expect the same standard from each other. As members of our city and stewards to our public, we hold ourselves accountable for our actions and the code of conduct assists in providing good governance. Take some time to review the document and make our code your guidepost to how you carry yourselves each and every day. This concludes our training on the City of El Paso Code of Conduct. As you can see from our presentation, having a purposeful code builds trust within our city and with all of our stakeholders who are affected by our actions each and every day, including our employees, residents, businesses, and visitors. An effective code of conduct underpins the values of our city and demonstrates that our standard is to treat each other and others with dignity and respect. Remember, for our code of conduct to be successful, we all individually need to own it as a key aspect of our mission, vision, and values, and keep behavioral standards top of mind each and every day. Thanks for your attention and thanks for all you do in making El Paso a great place to live and work. That's the end of it. If you can go back to the presentation and there's only two more slides and I will wrap it up by now. Thank you. Thank you. So in summary, we just want to make sure that we have a cooperative and professional workplace environment and board committee meetings. Our personal conduct and behavior is not only a reflection of who we are as individuals, but also a reflection of the city of El Paso. And we should keep that in mind at all times. Show mutual respect at all times. And we're all responsible to adhere to the behavioral standards. Next slide, please. Reminder that we work for the common good of the community and we must assure, assure fair and equal treatment to all. The public expects the higher standards of professional conduct from all representatives of the local government to include our board and committee members. And as a committee member in the organization, you're also accountable to the community. And, uh, and this code will assist in providing for the good governance of the city of El Paso. 
And again, I can't thank you if not enough for the service and your expertise to our boards and committees and for the, all the time that you put in those in those different uh, committees. And that's all I have for today. Do you have any questions? Any questions? Board members and commissioners, if you have any question, please raise your hand in the chat option so you can be acknowledged. Thank you. Yes, and I apologize for the video. There was a lot of feedback in the background. I'm sorry, that was my fault. This is Alex with IT. We had a some when I had to share the video for some reason it, it was picking up the, the background noise. Uh, I apologize about that. No, that's OK. Thank you. If you have no questions, th this is it for the code of conduct presentation. Have a blessed day. Thank you for your service and your time. Thank you. OK. Um, to adjourn the meeting, uh, may we have a motion and a second to adjourn the meeting? I move to adjourn the meeting. This is Alicia Dijon Davis. I second the motion, Romy Ledesma. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? And the joint meeting is adjourned at 3.50 p.m. Thank you for Thank your you time. Stay safe and healthy. Likewise. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Have a good Bye, day. everybody. Goodbye, Rami. Bye, Alicia. Have Thank a good day, everybody.